Every noir narrative from the uh, short stories of Edgar Allan Poe, his Dupin narratives in particular, down to, let's say, uh, Henning Mankell's Bollander novels, begins with a corpse, every single one of them. And what normally happens is that the noir uh, hero, the detective, using the scientific method, goes back and begins with the corpse as an effect. So the, the normal cause-effect sequence note is reversed. The noir narrative begins with the effect first, and then the detective, using the scientific method, goes back and looks for the causes that brought that corpse into being, so that by the time he reaches the end of the narrative, he replays the movie film in correct chronological sequence, which shows us how that corpse came into being out of that sequence of events. And the reader thereby participates vicariously in the scientific method. Uh, now, the Christian tradition, too, uh, from out of which the West has come, has at its root a corpse also. If we trace the genealogical tree, the so-called tree of Jesse, all the way down to its roots, we find there the skull of Adam. And indeed, in depictions of the crucifixion during the medieval, the period of the great medieval art, and you can especially find this in the 15th century art of the Flemish painters, um, normally the crucifixion was depicted with the skull of Adam represented uh, at the foot of the cross. And indeed, the hill that he's crucified on, Golgotha, means the hill of the skull or the place of the skull. So we have Adam and Eve, really two corpses uh, at the root of the whole Christian tradition. And likewise, if we look back at the history of our mortuary practices our, of the human tradition, we arrive there at a pair of corpses, a sort of Adam and Eve, as it were, of this tradition, where we find the earliest documented human burials in Israel, uh, in Palestine, dating roughly from the period of about 100,000 years ago. One of the burials is uh, from the so-called Protochromanions and is found in a cave at Kafse. Uh, in Israel, and the other burial is found uh, 60,000 years ago, and it's a Neanderthal burial, and it is found also in a cave nearby, not too far away from Kafse, uh, Kabara Cave in Israel. Uh, now the cave note, um, the earliest uh, association of burial with the cave is of course not accidental because the cave is traditionally regarded as the gateway to the underworld. It still is in Virgil's Aeneid, in which Aeneas has to pluck the golden bough in order to gain entrance to the cave, and he goes through the cave, and that leads the way down to Avernus. So there's a long tradition of association of the cave as the, the gateway or the portal to another world, an underworld, a world beneath and behind the visible one. Now, if we look back, if we want to look back even further at um, anything that smacks of the earliest burial or the earliest disposal of the dead, not burial, but the disposal of the dead, the candidate for that may go back, clear back to the proto-Neanderthals, uh, the so-called uh, species known in Europe as Homo heidelbergensis, who goes back to about 300,000 years ago, at a site at, out of Puerca, Spain, which its excavators uh, denotated as Cima de los Huesos, or the Pit of the Bones, in which was found in this pit the disarticulated bones of over 30 individuals, men, women, children of all ages, and it could not have been a cave-in because there are no food leavings found uh, or scraps that uh, would normally be associated with daily habitation were found in connection with this cave. So it was not a cave-in, and it looks like then, indeed, Neanderthals may have been the first to start disposing of their dead by throwing them into this cavern, this abyss, this hole in the ground. So, uh, returning back then to the Adam and Eve of our tradition here, uh, we begin with Eve. She is the uh, she's known unimaginatively as Q9 to excavators, and she is found buried inside this cave in Kafse in uh, Israel, where there are about the bones of about 15 to 20 or so other individuals who are found buried in and around this cave. Uh, but here we find the body of a woman with a child buried at her feet. There is very little grave gear buried with her, but the bones of both the woman and the child were stained with a light pink mist, the color of iron oxide, and this is of course red ochre. And this burial is the earliest example of the appearance of red ochre, which becomes associated with burial traditions all through the Paleolithic, all through the Neolithic, and goes right on up into the Bronze Age, and migrates from, uh, let's say, from Palestine here from Israel all the way across to India and China. In China, it will later become substituted for cinnabar, which will be found in connection with burials there. Uh, in India, this will become substituted for a red shroud. The dead are wrapped during the Neolithic in India at the site of Marigar, about 7000 BC. The dead there are wrapped in a red shroud. That red shroud, I believe, later becomes the yellow shroud that to this day we find uh, the Hindus wrapping their, their dead up in. 
Now, the best explanation for what this red ochre originally symbolized uh, has come from William Irwin Thompson, who in his book Coming Into Being mentions that it may have actually symbolized blood, and more specifically menstrual blood. If we go back to, as Hillman, James Hillman remarks in The Myth of Analysis, if we go back to the writings of Aristotle, we find there an early gynecological theory whereby the reason it was thought that the reason the woman stopped menstruating during pregnancy was because she was using that blood uh, withholding it, as it were, to rebuild the new body of the embryo within her womb. And so that may have been the direct analogy for sprinkling the bones of the dead with red ochre, because now they're going to need the powers of Mother Earth, the womb of the Earth, and this magical equivalent for the menstrual blood to rebuild a new body, by means of which they will come back. And that becomes one of the constitutive features of Cro-Magnon burials. Neanderthals, on the other hand, didn't use red ochre, except with one or two exceptions, not very often. So if we look at the other burial, which dates uh, from about 60,000 BC, we find at Kabara Cave, um, the remains of an individual, a male individual in this case, whose excavators named him Mashi, uh, rather affectionately. Uh, and he is found with no red ochre on him, and most of the bones are there with the exception, significantly, of the top half of his cranium. The jaw is still remaining intact with the skeleton, but the top part of the cr uh, cranium is no longer there, which may be significant because later on in this same part of the world at Jericho, 9500 BC, there will be, there will emerge a custom whereby the top half of the skull is removed and it's redecorated with lime plaster and little cowrie shells are placed into the eye sockets as a means of reanimating the dead person. Um, so the skull cult may have originated with the Neanderthals, and indeed, uh, I think there's very good evidence if we go back through history that the skull cult did indeed originate with them. Now, the equivalent here, maybe with the Neanderthals, um, is the idea that the missing bone is used to regrow the new skeleton, just the same way Thor does in Scandinavian myth when he has to kill both of his goats because he's starving and he needs to eat them. He sets aside a couple of their bones because he knows he can use the bones to magically regrow the bodies of the goats. And there may have been something similar uh, thought in the minds of Neanderthal man that if you save some of the bones, you can regrow the body. And so the bone becomes for the Neanderthal the magically reviv revivifying substance whose equivalent amongst the Cro-Magnon burials is the blood. So bone and blood are at the origins of these traditions. Now the skull cult, as I have said, most likely originates with the Neanderthal. Uh, we have the remains of skull cults going all the way back. Uh, there's a Neanderthal site at Arago, France. Uh, that's another one of these Homo heidelbergensis sites that goes all the way back to about 400,000 years ago, where we find the remains of a single pre-Neanderthal skull perched upside down atop a clutter of human and animal bones in the debris of a cave. Now the puzzling thing about this skull is that the back half of it is missing as if it had deliberately been broken open in order to get access to the brains inside. Uh, now the skull cult often turns up later uh, in history as in uh, the traditions of Oceania in connection with cannibalism because it's thought that eating the brains of the dead person is a means of ingesting their mana, of ingesting their power. And uh, you can find an echo of this surviving all the way down in Greek myth, uh, in the myth of Tydeus, who is the father of the warrior hero Diomedes, who horrified uh, Athena by gobbling up the brains of his slain enemy Melanippus. She had been just about to confer immortality upon him, but that act of savagery uh, really, really blew it for him as far as she was concerned. Um, <clears throat> so um, the next, if we move down our timeline uh, to about 130,000 years ago, we come to the site of Krepina in Croatia, where we find more evidence that is suggestive of both Neanderthal cannibalism and possibly a skull cult. At this site, the bones of about 80 individuals from 16 to 24 years of age were found with interesting incisions on them, which imply that the flesh here was sliced away from the bones. Now, there's only two explanations for slicing the flesh away from the bones, uh, of, from human bones, which is either that uh, people were hungry and had nothing else to eat, but the site remains that these sites don't indicate that because we find plenty of animal bones here that indicate that they were eating, they had plenty of food. Uh, and more likely, the latter explanation is that uh, this was a ritual defleshing process, which links it with cannibalism. So it looks like Neanderthals were also uh, cannibals in addition to this. Uh, if we glance over at the site now of Teshik Tash in Uzbekistan, down around 70,000 years ago, uh, this gives us a glimpse of a Neanderthal child, uh, the skull of a Neanderthal child, 
placed neatly on the ground and surrounded with a delicate little circle of ibex horns all pointing up out of the dirt like a little miniaturized Stonehenge. Uh, so there's an example whereby the skull of a child has been deliberately set aside. And in these traditions, you don't just set aside the skull of anyone. It's only the revered dead. People who in the tribe are revered, you remove their skulls as a means of keeping them around, keeping them in close communication. It's almost as though the skull were thought of as a kind of radio transmitter or receiver for communicating with the departed. But in any case, the skull cult is linked with a strong reverence for the dead and indicates the, uh, the presence of the cult of ancestor worship, which is still would be consistent with ne the Neanderthal conservatism. Neanderthals were incredibly conservative. We find them occupying the same caves and the same sites for tens of thousands of years with very little change in the grave gear at these sites. About 50,000 years ago at La Farzie, France, uh, we come across the remains of a Neanderthal man and woman buried lying head to head while the skull from a child nearby was removed and buried separately beneath a stone slab painted with red ochre and marked with small cup-shaped depressions. So this was one of the rare examples of Neanderthals using red ochre, which was uh, extremely rare for them to do. So we find it looks like the Neanderthals originated the skull cult, and um, so they, they definitely buried their dead. They definitely disposed of them. But now, if you read the works of today's anthropologists, individuals like David Lewis Williams or Ian Tattersall, you wouldn't think that because what has happened is that the Neanderthals have been dehumanized, uh, as they undoubtedly were in the eyes of Cro-Magnon man, who probably regarded them as beasts. David Lewis Williams in his book, The Mind in the Cave, is guilty of a similar attitude where he says that the Neanderthals, though they could make fine blades, uh, must have been congenital atheists and obviously could not have had a belief in the afterlife. So this is a complete shift from early on in the end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, uh, and you find Joseph Campbell popularizing this idea of the bear cult worshiping Neanderthal who buries his dead and the earliest origins for the earliest uh, religious cult anywhere in the world uh, in the writings of Joseph Campbell is the bear cult worship. We find bear bones in some of these caves, bear skulls that are set aside. Uh, but now all of this has been debunked for the most part as the result of the success of the so-called out of Africa migration theory because it used to be thought that um, Cro-Magnon man might possibly have evolved from Neanderthals, but now we know that since earlier bones have been found going clear back as far as remains at Harto, Ethiopia in Africa, where we find the remains of the oldest modern Homo sapiens found yet anywhere, this dates back to about 160,000 years ago, which does coincide just about with the so-called Emian interglacial period, which dates from about 130,000 to 114,000 years ago. So uh, the climate was changing and it was beginning to warm up and a new mutation in the hominid line appears to have happened here. Now, Europe, meanwhile, had been populated for hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years by Neanderthals. And so uh, it doesn't look like uh, Cro-Magnon anymore can be regarded as having descended from Neanderthals. So the result of that is to make, uh, is to demonize or vilify Neanderthals by making them look as other culturally as it is possible to make them. And so uh, an effort, a deconstructive effort, a sort of character assassination has been set in motion to remove from them the whole idea of them practicing burial of the dead and having any kind of sophisticated religiosity at all. All of that is probably wrong. That's a form of racism. It's an anthropological racism, and it's a, it's a sort of recrudescence of what must originally have been the racist attitudes of the Cro-Magnons, who probably wiped the Neanderthals out through genocide, though we don't have any direct evidence for that. But it does appear suspicious that with uh, the proto-Cro-Magnons coming up through Palestine, although it is the case, puzzlingly, that Cro-Magnons uh, seem to have existed alongside of Neanderthals in Palestine for about 50,000 years, peacefully, before about 45,000 years ago, the proto-Cro-Magnons moved up into Europe. We find their first tool industries, Aurignacian flints and blades, turning up about 43,000 years ago now. So we know they were there that early. And by 27,000 years ago, Neanderthals are simply gone. They've become extinct. So uh, it, the evidence is very circumstantial, but it looks as though there was a race war and the Cro-Magnons who were lighter uh, had a more gracile physique, but were definitely smarter and more technologically cunning and clever, uh, seem to have eliminated uh, through ethnic cleansing the Neanderthals and simply wiped them out. Most likely what also took place was racial intermixing 
uh, it's standard practice for throughout human history for a new population to come into a landscape kill all the males nearby and rape the women and then you get uh, the absorption of the conquered gene pool and indeed it does look like we have inherited certain genes from Neanderthals though we may not be directly descended from them we have inherited some of their genes through these rape processes for example we have to consider the strange skeleton of a buried four-year-old child found at Lagar Velho cave in Portugal dating back to about 25,000 years ago and this uh, individual was a Neanderthal Homo sapiens hybrid a hybrid that's beyond dispute. The skeleton was laid out on an east-west axis with the head pointing east in the direction of the rising sun and was thoroughly stained with red ochre. So uh, this skeleton exhibits morphological attributes from both species and one of the things that um, we seem to have inherited from Neanderthals is uh, the bump that we have on the back of our skulls and a certain type of dental cranial nerve. All of that we seem to have inherited from Neanderthals because Modern Homo sapiens coming out of Africa, those ones that we talked about 160,000 years ago, did not have these morphological attributes. So it looks like there has indeed been racial intermixing here, and the Neanderthals have been absorbed into our uh, European gene pool. Now, the Cro-Magnons were extremely clever. They represent uh, a total creative singularity. They come into being here. They enter into onto the stage of European history 45,000 years ago. By 35,000 years ago, we begin to get the so-called creative explosion. The technologies that are associated with um, the Cro-Magnons are extremely sophisticated by comparison with the Neanderthal technologies. Um, whereas Neanderthals, their toolkits tended to be, uh, they tended to have maybe 60 or so different tools at each of their sites whereas more than twice that number is normally found uh, at the, the cave sites of Cro-Magnon Man. Uh, a typical figure for a Neanderthal site might be like 15, for, for one site might be like 15 or different tools. That, that's 60 tools total for the, for the whole species. But at one site we might find 15 or so different tools, while at the average Cro-Magnon site there might be like 40 to 50 different kinds. And the Cro-Magnons uh, Cro bring with them these, uh, these so-called Aurignacian tool industries, where we find a lot of bone working, which the Neanderthals tended to eschew. They weren't much interested in carving bone. But we find bone and antler working now, uh, new media for tools and works of art. Um, we find new kinds of tools, new burins, and tools for making other tools, which was a concept not possessed by Neanderthals. You might find a two-in-one tool, for example, where there might be a burin at one end and a scraper at the other. Uh, Cro-Magnons also had much more sophisticated cooking practices on their floors, uh, Neanderthals simply just burn their fires directly on the floor with a couple of stones around it to keep out the wind, whereas Cro-Magnon actually dug hollowed pits into the ground, surrounded them as we still to do today at campsites with stones, and they would feature a little narrow channel scooped out at the bottom to create a draft for more effective burning. So um, any way you look at it, the tool industries of Cro-Magnon Man are, are much more uh, much more extensive. They've got bone needles, so now they're starting to tailor. They're actually starting to sew animal skins together, uh, which is something that Neanderthals, as far as we know, did not do. Later, we get the Atlatls, the great spear throwers from the Magdalenian period, and um, many, many complicated tools. The bow and arrow is coming in and all of this. And so the complexification then of the human brain that is evident in the profusion of Cro-Magnon innovations at this time now begins to move toward an event horizon about 30,000 BC in which we start getting uh, images once perceived luminously in the mind's middle eye are now projected forth in painted and sculpted forms. Uh, this is a total singularity. This is the first of our six singularities that we've gone looking for. This is the creative singularity in which we get the first art, the first sculpted figurines start appearing during this period at places like Geisen Klosterla where we find in Eastern Europe these little sculpted ivory figurines of woolly mammoths and um, we find a shaman man lion standing erect we find horses and in western Europe we find the first at the cave of Chauvet in France about 33,000 BC we find the first two-dimensional art the first actual paintings so we get this great creative explosion that goes on and what I want to draw your attention to here is that this creative singularity occurs in connection with a, a so-called, what I'm calling a mortuary rupture, because all of a sudden we don't find any burials associated with Cro-Magnon man from this period. From about 45,000 clear down to 29,000 years ago, there aren't any burials, and we don't know what they were doing with their dead. They might have been putting them up in trees, that's possible. 
but they just simply disappear for the most part, whereas the Neanderthals, who are extremely conservative and represent the tradition, as it were, of the elders, with the Cro-Magnon coming in here, representing the beginnings of the wonder child, with the West's earliest uh, technological inclination already being evident here with them. Uh, the Neanderthals do continue burying their dead during this period, though, um, they, so their burials are still going on. So here we find our first scenario in which a slackening or a relaxation of the cult of the revered dead takes place in accordance with a sudden technological explosion and acceleration, an acceleration both of art and technology, and the dead, as far as Cro-Magnon in Western Europe goes, is they're just nowhere on the scene. Um, <clears throat> when they do finally return, it's cleared down to about 29,000 years ago, where we find uh, burials now beginning to reappear amongst the Cro-Magnons, um, although they tend to occur mostly in Eastern Europe now. Uh, although this first one here, 29,000 years ago, is known as the Red Lady of Paviland from Wales, uh, although it turns out that it wasn't a lady at all. It was originally thought to be a female skeleton. Uh, and this was first discovered in a place called uh, Go Goat's Hole Cave in 1823. It was a man about 21 years of age, and the head was missing, so it looks very possible like uh, as though the Cro-Magnons have inherited from the Neanderthals the skull cult, uh, the worship of the revered dead. The body was laid flat out on its back with the legs extended. Uh, and the earlier custom prior to this point with the burials of Cro-Magnon man had been to, uh, um, ex to flex the knees and put the individual into a kind of fetal posture. But here the individual is laid out flat for the first time as, as far as we can tell. This is also known as the first status burial because this man was buried with a handful of periwinkle shells and some carved ivory rods and rings. And the body was, of course, thoroughly stained with red ochre. So this implies probably that this individual was a shaman because you don't go to this kind of elaborate um, burial and ceremony for just anyone. It's the revered individual. And more often, many of these, more often than not, most of these burials that we do find tend to be uh, shamans, or most likely shamans. And they tend to come now from Eastern Europe, which is actually uh, a different culture. This is the Gravettian Europe of the mammoth hunters, which is a very different culture from the Aurignacian Cro-Magnon men of Western Europe. Um, these people did not live in caves in Eastern Europe. They lived in mammoth huts that were made out of, they were freestanding shelters made out of mammoth bones uh, covered with uh, mammoth skins. And um, their primary iconology tended to be centered around the, the goddess, the, the, the female, the great goddess, and the shaman. And very often the shamans in this tradition turn out to be female. The next earliest burial of Cro-Magnon man, which is almost contemporary actually with the Red Lady of Pavilion, comes to us then from this Pavlovian culture of Moravia, which was Grav Gravedian, as I've said. Um, <clears throat> and these people did not live in or near caves, but as I've said, in these freestanding huts. And some of them were, were made out of stone. They weren't all just made out of bones. Um, and the burial here uh, is from a place called Birno, and it's generally considered the oldest known burial of a Cro-Magnon shaman, although it's very likely that the so-called Red Lady of Pavilion was, was actually a shaman. But here we have this individual had been wearing a cap with more than 600 dentalium shells carefully sewn onto it, and a variety of animal bones were interred with him, including the shoulder blade and tusk of a mammoth, the skull of a woolly rhino, its ribs, uh, we note, were stained with red ochre, a reindeer antler, and some horse teeth. Also worth noting was the presence of a unique little doll carved out of movable pieces of ivory of an apparently ithyphallic individual, which was probably the shaman's astral double. We know that it was the sh shaman because we find his drumstick buried along with him. Uh, it was broken in half. And um, the fact that this individual was crippled with severe periostitis, which is a bone disease, also indicates, there's also very strong evidence for this being a shaman, since shamans were normally also crippled. Uh, you find this tradition going all the way down into the blacksmiths, where in Greek mythology, remember, Hephaestus, the master of fire, uh, is, a, is lame, is crippled. Velan the smith is also, uh, has to be, his, he's hamstrung by, by the king and he has to invent a pair of wings, mechanical wings, to fly away because his, his legs are hamstrung. So this, this technique, or this rather, this, this um, tradition of the one who is set aside, the one who has the calling uh, and who justifies his existence, as it were, in the, in the eyes of the tribe, um, because he is crippled, in many cases, 
in these days, a lot of the, the crippled or deformed individuals who are born might have been just ritually abortified and slain. But those who did survive tended to justify their existence uh, in the eyes of the tribe because they would have been useless for hunting, let's say, uh, as men, um, by accessing the visionary realm. So they get the vision calling and they become shamans and they access the visionary realm and this justifies their existence, which is why we find so often these shamans in these graves uh, have various kinds of diseases associated with them. Going down our timeline to about 25,000 years ago, the next burial that we find is from the site of Sungir in Russia, uh, where we find a 60-year-old male who was adorned with about 10,000 beads carved out of mammoth ivory, each one of which supposedly took its artisan about an hour to make. So we've got another one of our status burials here, probably also a shaman. He was wearing bracelets and a headband made out of mammoth ivory, so this links him with the group of the mammoth hunting peoples. Near him was found the skull of a woman sprinkled with red ochre, and nearby also were found two children placed head-to-head -head with some 8,000 ivory beads, arctic fox canine teeth, assorted rings and bracelets, and 16 spears, darts, and daggers. So in addition, uh, the two boys, aged 7 to 9, roughly, and 12 and 13, uh, also possessed two very rare spears that were made out of mammoth ivory, which were, must have been very difficult and time-consuming to straighten, since, of course, mammoth tusks and mammoth tusks are, are curved. Um, now, at the nearby site, there's another interesting burial at the site of Predmosti, which is located not very far away from the, the other Birno site that we talked about. There was found an interesting burial, a collective burial, in a pit, which had been dunk, dug down in the center of the camp and in which the hunters had tossed 12 children and adolescents together with eight adults into a mass grave, with very little in the way of funerary gear. So this would be the opposite to a status burial, and it's either likely that we already have the earliest origins of human sacrifice going on here, or as I rather suspect, there was a disease and a plague, and these individuals have been thrown in as the result of, of a collective death. Now at the nearby site of Dolny Vestinice, which is one of the great sites uh, at this time, dating to about 23,000 years ago, we find a very strange burial here. This is one of my favorites because it's so utterly enigmatic. We find three individuals, one woman in between two men. One of the men is turned over onto his stomach while the arms of the other man are placed into the woman's lap. The woman's lap is sprinkled with red ochre. Uh, that argues very strongly of the, for the linkage between red ochre and menstrual blood. Well, the man lying on his stomach had a wooden stake stuck through his pelvis. Interesting. The woman had the fragment of a reindeer's penis bone shoved into her mouth, and she too suffered from a disease, rickets and scoliosis, while the skull of the other man was smashed in. And the grave was, had been covered with a wooden, kind of wooden shell uh, that was very slight at the time of the burial. Uh, this looks like this was a shaman woman here. And in the Eastern Gravedian tradition, uh, the shamans were very often female. And perhaps we have a shaman woman, as indicated by the disease, and maybe these were two of her lovers that were buried along with her. We, we don't know what's happened here, but it's, it's very strange, possibly uh, a love triangle. So now what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we do have here, at the dawn of history, two very separate cultures. Um, we have the Eastern uh, European culture, which is the Gravettian culture, uh, which tends to be, as I've said, a mammoth uh, hunting culture, uh, where the shaman and the goddess are the primary figures, and the earliest art of sculpture from Geisen Klosterla, uh, about 33,000 BC, comes from this culture, from the East, but not painting. Sculpture does, these little sculpted figurines. Meanwhile, in the West, with the Aurignacian peoples, we get the first painted caves, but not sculpture. So we've got two different traditions here that cross, and apparently the Gravedian peoples uh, nearing down to about 30,000 or 29,000 BC began to cross. And as the result of the crossing of the two cultures, we begin to get the appearance of the goddess now in the West, who appears carved into um, uh, on rock ledges, such as the Venus of Lazelle, who was carved onto a rock ledge, which seems to be a kind of compromise between the two-dimensional art traditions of the West and the three-dimensional parietal art of the East. They meet their comp compromise in the invention of relief sculpture here. We also find the first great goddess figurines, the Venus of Villendorf, the Venus of Le Pugue. These are masterpieces coming out of this tradition now. So the two cultures have crossed, but by 20,000 BC, they appear to separate and pull apart because the goddess disappears from Western Europe. 
you don't see her image appearing in the art of Western Europe during the Magdalenian period at all at places like Lascaux or Altamira. There are, there's simply no goddess imagery to, to be found at these cave sites. But we do find her migrating into the east, into Siberia at this time, where her latest appearance is about 14,000 BC at uh, Baikal, which is um, at Malta in Siberia, Lake Baikal, where we find her there. And apparently uh, the Eskimo inherit her because we find her appearing in Eskimo mythology as Sedna, who is the mistress of the animals uh, whose fingers are chopped off. Uh, and the fingers fall into the water in, in a pursuit. They fall into the water and they transform into, into seals and animals. And she goes down into the underworld. And the shaman in Eskimo mythology normally has to go down and visit her. And he has to use a special comb because her, she's missing fingers. So she can't comb her hair. And the shaman has to use a special comb to comb all the parasites out of her hair in order to appease her so that she will release the animal herds so the Eskimo don't starve. Uh, that appears to be the Paleolithic goddess uh, and where she went and migrated and, because she certainly disappeared from Western Europe. So <clears throat> I want to conclude this discussion then on the Paleolithic burial tradition with one more burial from Dolny Vestanice in the east, uh, which is a burial that is found inside of a house. And this begins the tradition of uh, what we will find all through the Neolithic as house burials, where the dead are buried under the floors of the living spaces. And this is a common tradition that we find, will find all the way down. Notice that in the movie Steven Spielberg's Poltergeist, the very horror of that film is that it is found out that a cemetery has been located directly beneath the house of the suburban occupants living there. That, to us moderns, is the absolute horror. And so um, we will find, as, as the evolution of human culture goes on, from the Paleolithic through the Neolithic down to the Pottery Neolithic, that the dead are buried under the floors of the houses, but they will eventually be separated out into separate cemeteries. And that once this begins to happen in the so-called Pottery Neolithic, the way begins to be cleared for the rise of the first high civilizations. With the dead out of the way, technological acceleration can explode, which is exactly what does happen. So looking at this last burial from Delny Vestanice, we find a skeleton of a small, elegantly built woman She's about 40 years old, which, which is very old for those days. The, most people didn't live past the age of 30 at that time. She had been given an elaborate burial inside one of the huts, laid in a prepared hollow on her left side in a contracted position, facing west this time rather than east. Her body and head were covered with the magically revivifying red ochre, and it was protected by two shoulder blades of, of mammoth, one of which had a network of irregular lines incised on its surface. So we might already have the earliest origins for writing coming in here with incision marks made on mammoth bones. Uh, with the woman were placed her stone tools and close to her left hand, the paws and tail of an Arctic fox with uh, the fox teeth in her other hand. So once again, this is probably a shaman as her elaborate grave gear testifies. And we have our association with the mammoth. So we have what will later become the Neolithic cult of the goddess and bull, which will first surface or rather resurface at the site of Muraibed about 10,000 BC on the upper Euphrates. Here we have it, uh, the goddess, the shaman, and the bull. The bull in this place what originally began as the woolly mammoth and is later substituted in the Middle East for the bull. Go, that cult goes all the way down to Chatalhoyuk and its last gasp will be when Gilgamesh and Enkidu hunt the bull, uh, cut it apart, and throw its haunch in mockery at Inanna. And that represents the sunset effect in the Gilgamesh epic of this entire tradition of goddess and bull that began here with this burial of the goddess and the mammoth. So by 10,000 BC, the European Paleolithic creative explosion comes to an end. The age of the shaman and the great hunt, too, uh, is beginning to pass as the cold weather warms up and it brings heavy rainfall that causes the migration of the forests in the north and new grasses start coming in.